So um, that's a tough talk to follow, but, but that's okay, actually. We've, we've been essentially trying to do much the same thing. But as you can kind of guess from our title, we're not as far along. So I'm going to tell you how not to try to vent a high altitude balloon. Um, although one of the things that I've actually been telling my students is let's wait until after this conference in hopes that we get some feedback about what we've been trying and in particular some of the things we've been experiencing that haven't been working. And I think I know at least one person I need to talk to about that. So um, thanks again. My name is uh, James, of course. Most of you know me and I work with the Minnesota Space Grant and I'm housed at the, in the Aerospace Department at the University of Minnesota. I have a couple students with me, but it turns out the students who worked on this particular project were unable to attend this conference, which is a scary thing because they know much more about it than I do, but I'll, I'll do my best to, uh, to tell you about some of the things that we've been trying. Um, this will be a little bit more than just VENT. VENT is one of the uh, projects that we're trying to use an uplink downlink system to accomplish, so I'm going to talk about all of the above, and this is probably of the technical talks this afternoon, at least maybe the least technical. We're, we're trying to do this kind of the old-fashioned way. So how do I use this? Not like that. Not like that. Oh, okay. So uh, just for completeness, I put my abstract here. I'm not going to go through and read that. But um, so here's the big picture. Mostly when we do balloon flights, in our group at least, we, we put things on board. They're autonomous. They, they take data. We don't get the data until we recover the balloon. Of course, we want to recover our stuff, but uh, getting information down during the course of the flight is always interesting. And so essentially the big picture here is that we want our ground station to be able to talk to balloons as they're in flight. So let's say we are going to uplink some sort of commands. Typically, we haven't done experiments that require this, but we're trying to gain this capability, a little bit behind what they've done. Um, and then, of course, we want the balloon to be able to talk to us. Now, we all do downlink latitude, longitude, that sort of information. But in this particular case, we want to downlink not only data from experiments, but also maybe downlink the uplinked commands just to make sure that they did, in fact, get through. And other housekeeping data, I'll explain some of the reasons for doing that. Um, and then possibly having some sort of a network between balloons. Again, we have systems, for instance, Stratostar systems that do this already. But you can learn a lot from trying to figure these things out for yourself. Um, I guess one of my mottos, those who know me know that I have many mottos. And one of my mottos is, you know, learn from the mistakes of others. You can't possibly live long enough to make them all yourself. So uh, here we go. Um, what we have chosen to do um, for our uplink is to use ham radio and do encoding with DTMF. I'll talk to you a little bit more later about what DTMF stands for and how it works. Turns out you all know about it, although you may not recognize that name. Um, downlink, the system that we used for DTMF uplink, in fact, wasn't capable of doing downlink. So we just used our Stratosat uh, Zigbee um, connection for doing downlink. That was really overkill, and I'm hoping to actually make that more appropriate in the future, but that's what we've used for the moment. Um, and then our um, network. Hello, there we go. Uh, we'll do some networking between payloads by XB radio. So the idea here is that we'll have a communications pod on board, we'll talk to that one pod, and then that pod, as necessary, can talk to other things that are also on board. Um, and so we can actually get uplink commands spread around to more than one, more than one of the, the flight uh, vehicles. So um, I'll talk to you about two payloads in particular. One is our DTMF, or our communications payload, and that's uh, take uplink commands, echo them back down, relay them on to other places with XB, XB network, and then a, a, a specific um, experiment that could benefit from having this capability is our, our float payload, and so I'll talk about how we did it, and it's going to look very different and pretty clumsy, frankly, compared to the one you just saw. But um, it, it does work, sort of. Uh, it works, it just doesn't do what it's supposed to do, and so I'm, I'm trying to figure that one out. So let's talk a little bit briefly about uh, uplink. So essentially, the, the way Uplink works is we'll have our ham radio on the ground. We will key in DTMF codes, a little bit more about that coming up soon. Um, and then there will be a ham radio on board the flight, which is listening on the proper frequency. And that receiver, the audio, will go out of that receiver into an Arduino stack with a shield. And on that shield will actually be a DTMF shield, which can decode these audio signals. Once those signals have been decoded, they're, they're then interpreted by the Arduino and then sent out through the XB network, also sent out to the Stratostar system to be uh, sent back to the ground as an echo. Um, and then we're, we're listening on the ground with our, our Stratostat ground station. So this kind of requires two different ground stations in some sense. Again, I'm kind of hoping to get beyond that in the future. Um, 
DTMF stands for dual tone multi-frequency. You probably know of it as touch tone. It's essentially those tones you hear when you touch your phone. Um, so the way this works, simplistically speaking, is that underneath, and this is how you know, most keypads work actually, underneath your keys you have wires. The wires run vertically and horizontally, and so when you touch a given key, you, you make a contact. You make a contact on one vertical wire and one horizontal wire, and then the computer or whatever knows which key you've touched. Well, in this particular case, essentially, the vertical wire under one, four, seven, and star produces an audio tone. 1207 hertz, 1209 hertz, okay? And then the vertical wire under one, two, three, and A, if you happen to have letters on your keypad, okay, produces a second, in this case, lower frequency. So if you press the one, you get 19, uh, 1209 hertz and 697 hertz. You may not be able to hear that with your ears, but there are two frequencies there. If you put a spectrum analyzer on it, you'll clearly see those two frequencies. As you proceed down, you'll get a bunch of different tones, all of which have the 1209 in common, but they have different lower frequencies. Or as you proceed across, you'll get a series of frequencies which have 697 in common, but different higher frequencies, hence dual tone. Um, so many ham radios and, and many other objects, obviously, can produce these signals. And once you have these signals going as audio signals, then you just need something that can interpret them. And that's what that DTMF shield uh, was for. This is what it looks like. Um, so just found this on the internet. It turns out it's not a product. Uh, actually, I'm not sure it's, <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure this is even on the internet anymore, except in archival form, but uh, this isn't something you can just buy. SparkFun or whatever doesn't sell this, but essentially what you can do is you can go there, you can get the, the Eagle files or whatever they are. Uh, that's where the students would come in handy. They would know exactly what they are and then build these things. So we, we had some boards made, we made these things up. And so as the uh, audio signal comes in, uh oh, sorry. Uh, through this jack up here, the, the audio jack, then basically the, the, the number will be displayed here if it's, if it's properly interpreted. And then this shield is sitting on top of an Arduino and then the Arduino knows what is going on and, and can proceed accordingly. So we chose to use series of three digits. So a, a two, five, seven would come up in sequentially, two and five and seven, and then would be interpreted to do the appropriate thing. So um, there is, there is a, a reference of where we, where we found this, but, but it's a little bit old. So that's just uh, very briefly the hardware that we're using. We're not using satellite iridium links of any sort. Um, for downlink, like I said, we are using our Stratosat command pod and then Zigbee modules. So for those of you who are familiar with this sort of stuff, um, basically the Zigbees here are able to send onto the, the main command pod uh, information on many channels and then the command pod will relay them to the ground and then they will scroll across your screen, or if you're using the, the most recent software, they might be easier to read than that. But um, this allows us to get information, and frankly, for this project, we weren't sending like sensor information, we were sending status information. For instance, is a switch open or closed, as in, is that vent moved or not moved, okay? Um, one thing we, we wanted to do here was to also send information from the, uh, the Arduino about what it thought what it had tried to do and what was going on. Unfortunately, Arduinos don't have limited knowledge here, but Arduinos don't have like analog output and we're trying to send it through analog channels. So what you can do instead is you can, on the pulse width modulation digital channels, pretend to have an analog output and filter it appropriately. And so you can get a signal that's below high, between high and low, halfway or three quarters of the way, and it will get interpreted and sent down on the analog channels. So uh, I know other people do that, um, do that as well. So, and then the network is fairly straightforward, or so they tell me, um, basically XB modules are available for Arduinos, they can talk to each other. And so essentially the commands would go up, be sent around, in fact we would send all the commands around by the XB network, even the ones that weren't necessary for the people who were listening, the people, the, the, the payloads who were listening. So, um, having that sort of as the beginning of, or, or the, the general setup, let's talk now for the rest of my time, which I haven't been paying attention to. Um, about this float project, okay? And you'll see that uh, we had to solve, or tried to solve some of many of the same problems that Montana was struggling with. I'm glad Montana struggled at least a little bit. Um, and then I'll tell you at the very end about how far we've gotten and some of the things that, that have us still, still stymied. <clears throat> so the float project, which is just one thing that wants to make use of this communications network. So, um, as he already talked about, so I really don't need to go through maybe all of this, 
We're trying to float a balloon, use that, that to describe something that stops going up and stays at a given altitude um, and doesn't go immediately, at least not immediately, to burst. Many experiments can benefit from additional time at altitude. And, um, but unfortunately, this particular device is pretty heavy. And so once this device is on board, that limits how many other things we can fly, which is a disappointment. I, I like the, the other stuff looks a lot lighter than ours. Um, so, some just general comments about achieving float. If you are, if you've played with it, or even if you haven't played with it, um, essentially you need to somehow dump some of your excess lift. There's a variety of ways to do that. One thing might be to carry multiple balloons and cut away the balloons that you don't need, like an excess lift balloon. Another possibility, and this is how we've been doing it, is to try and vent uh, gas out through the neck. Um, Regardless of how you do it, something has to change about your flight profile, and therefore there has to be some, you know, mechanical, presumably electromechanical, uh, devices involved. So, um, in the case of venting from a, a latex balloon, you obviously need to play around with the neck. That's where the that's where the helium can come out from. Uh, we use helium. Uh, presumably, hydrogen would be much the same. So, we have inserted a, a vent mechanism of some sort into the neck, and that needs to be opened and closed. You could imagine one that opens and never closes again, but ours was intended to be openable and closable. Make sure it's closed really well at the beginning so you don't vent before you want to. And then when you open it, you want it to be as open as possible to make sure as much helium can come out as quickly as possible. And then this issue about is it, is your, your flow rate adequate? That's actually one of, one of our big, big challenges too. I'm not sure it is. Uh, the neck is a constricted place, of course. If you're using Howie balloons, I guess you might have a rather big neck, but mostly we've designed this for and used it on Kmont balloons. Um, helium, of course, doesn't like to come out of the bottom of a balloon. It wants to go out the top of a balloon. It would be better if the neck was on the top. So um, venting, in some sense, can be a kind of a slow process. We find that we can vent pretty effectively on the ground, but not so effectively in the air. And so I, I wonder about and would like to to learn more about other people's experiences with efficiency of venting, because ours seems to be too, I too inefficient when we try to vent at altitude. Um, as he already mentioned, that if you extend your flight time, that's the purpose of a vent, you may well extend your, your chase in distance. And perhaps you can do that uh, carefully and maybe even benefit from it, but it sounds to me like more often than not, or often at least, your, your flights are likely to be longer than they were before. So if you get involved in venting, keep that in mind. Consider that sort of a warning. Um, and then obviously, if you don't allow your balloon to go immediately to burst, then you have a derelict balloon. And you better make sure that you have some mechanism by which you can terminate the flight. Our flight termination is the more standard model of dropping things off of the balloon and letting the balloon fly away unpopped as opposed to what they were doing, and that was popping the balloon. So there's a variety of ways to try and approach this. Make sure it's robust, though, so you don't get in trouble. Um, and so in our case, we were, we were using a cut down. We were severing payloads. But as he, as he did mention, this gives a problem. And the reason is it's easy enough, maybe, to drop things off below the balloon. But the most expensive thing on board could well be that thing, which is tied tightly into the neck. And you want that to come loose, too. So by definition, you have to extract yourself from the neck of the balloon. I'm not talking popping the balloon now, I'm talking about dissociating with the balloon, and that actually is, is a difficult problem, which remains a problem for us because we have, we've stuck with this cut down mechanism as opposed to pop the balloon mechanism. I may have to rethink that one, I, I liked what I saw there. Um, so basically our project goals are to, um, we wanna be able to con command these venting events Preferably from the ground. We'll also have some onboard calculation power so that the thing can make its own decisions, especially if we lose communication with the ground and it says, well, you know, they were going to tell me to vent at 60,000 feet. Here I am, nobody's talking to me. I'm just gonna go ahead and do it myself. So there's some autonomy here, but uh, we do want to be able to control it from the ground. Um, and then downlink, like I said, is used to let the people on the ground know how it's going. In other words, send down the commands to make sure they were correctly interpreted. Also, is the vent open or closed? Um, has the payload separated properly, for instance? Uh, you, can, you can have things tied together, and then when those ties are broken, you know that things have started to come apart. In general, that's a good thing, if, if that's what you're after. Okay, so um, quickly now, here's some of our hardware. Basically, we have some sort of a tube that fits into the neck of the balloon, and then the base of the tube is covered with a cap, and then that cap has a servo, and the servo opens and closes it. So not a rotating mechanism, but a linear servo. Um, and then uh, also, since we're doing a cut down, we have 
uh, a nichrome wire. So the idea is the, the rigging from the balloon goes through this tube. And in the middle of this tube, a little hard to see, the laser is, is not working too well with this, this board here. But um, right there, the, the rigging will go through um, a, a coiled nichrome wire. And when that gets red hot, essentially it'll sever the rigging so as to drop off whatever is attached to the rigging. The trick is to figure out how to attach things properly so the right things drop off, including the vent. Um, here was one of our early ideas, which actually didn't pan out, but I liked this idea, so I thought I would share it with you. Um, in this particular case, this is not to scale, but here you see a balloon. Inside of the balloon, there's this tube. Here's our float payload, which is actually a pretty big box. It hangs directly from the balloon. It has a tube that sticks up inside of the other tube. And then the two were held together by some sort of a pin mechanism. Okay, so a pin which punctured both of them. It's very solid. It was a, really a nail, actually. Um, the parachute is down here. The payload is down here. And so what happens is, when you sever this main line, then the payload and the parachute start to fall. And when they start to fall, there's a, 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 slack, a slack line here from the float payload up to the pin. And when the payload starts to fall, it pulls the pin. And then when it pulls the pin, the tube slides out and off it goes. And so now the float payload has come out of the balloon and is able then to swing down all the way to the bottom of the stack. So it actually doesn't stay up there above the parachute. That's a bad place for a payload, frankly. But it falls to the bottom of the stack and then the whole thing descends. This is a, a rigging solution, a rather special rigging solution to get those things to come apart at the right time. It didn't work. And it didn't work for, maybe you can see this coming, I didn't see this coming. An interesting reason, it actually worked fine. Everything held together. But what happened is as the thing rotated, my slack line wasn't slack anymore. And not only wasn't slack anymore, but as it rotated more, it actually pulled the pin out before I had any intention of the pin to pull out. So this got to uh, 7,000 feet. And then it did its thing, and it came back down again. So in other words, this thing self came apart because that pin got pulled out. And the reason it got pulled out is because the line that was slack and was supposed to be waiting for things to fall off got tangled up because of natural rotation. I don't think that's actually even avoidable. So we stopped doing it this way. Um, here is a, a closer to current version of what we do. So in this particular case, again, we still have a tube that's in the balloon neck. The float payload has a tube that comes up to the neck. And in fact, I have this hardware with me. I, I'm not going to show it this afternoon, but I'll have it at the poster session tonight. And if you want to take a closer look at it, by all means, stop by. Um, and so in this particular case, what we do is we rig it so that there's a loop of string that, that attaches to the top here and holds these things together, goes underneath the float payload and back up again. So it goes down through one nichrome burner and then back up through a second nichrome burner. And then when we sever that loop, then the Parachute and all, everything below will fall out. And uh, frankly, this thing, which was tied together, no pins now, that's tied together with this loop of, of string. But once that string has actually been cut, these things will slide apart. This actually does work, and we've tested this a few times in flight as well as in tether tests. So this works better. And there's no strings to get tangled by rotation. These things don't rotate with respect to each other. And it still falls too close to the bottom of the stack during the, uh, during, during the descent. Um, here's some pictures of uh, one of our versions. We've made several, but one of our versions. Um, and so here is the tube that's in the balloon. Here's the tube that's part of the, the uh, float payload, which sticks up inside of it, and then O-rings to make sure that that's a reasonable seal. And then at the very bottom here is where that servo goes. And then there's some computational power on board to and a motor shield to open and close the servo, and then an XB to get commands into this thing from the, from the communications payload. Here's what it really looks like. Um, here is a picture of me holding it. So you can see that this is a sizable object. Um, and it's a pretty busy object. It's got, this is, uh, the, the vent payload is going to be able to tell the ground a few things. So here's a Zigbee radio. Here is a battery pack for those nichrome burners, which needs some pretty serious power. Um, and then here, I can see the, uh, the Arduino, which is going to make decisions. Um, and then this central tube has, at the bottom, a little bit hidden in this picture, has the, um, the servo. Here's a picture actually from a, from a ground test of this particular device. And we found that we could vent, for instance, uh, a couple pounds of excess lift in you know, five minutes without too much trouble on the ground. Turns out that we can't vent nearly that fast in the air. And that's something that uh, we need to think more about with this particular mechanism. And we were able to command this with uh, the DTMF to the, com the <laughs> DTMF signals to the DTMF payload, XB signals to this payload, open things, close things, vent things, et cetera, on the ground. Um, 
Here is a, a figure of our most recent version of this core to the float payload. It turns out that that piece that stuck out of the float payload had, had grooves in it for O-rings, which actually were places that it was, it was weak. And we broke it off there twice, once on landing hard, and once actually while trying to inflate a balloon in the first place. It's a bad thing to break something that important when you're, you haven't even flown the balloon yet. So this latest version actually has, ooh, sorry, has this insert from the balloon and then that's actually uh, goes in between a central piece and an outer piece, and so it's actually supported on both sides. So this is a whole lot stronger, and this seems to work very well. This is what it looks like when it's fully together. Um, this part is attached to the balloon, and then there's O-rings recessed inside of there to make this a good seal. Um, so here are some of, uh, and so part of this project actually was trying to figure out what are a reasonable set of commands. And so the commands have evolved also. But here, for instance, are some of the, th the, the things we were trying to be able to do. For instance, open the vent for one second, maybe, and close it. Or open it and close it immediately, um, just to test that it would open and close. That's typically a ground test. Um, add one hour to the fail-safe. We had a fail-safe timer that would count for four hours and then would fire the cutdowns, just to make sure that if we completely lost track of the thing, it would at least come back after four hours if it happened to get into a vented situation and was still in, in the air at four hours. And then we were able to change that number by radio. Um, open the vent indefinitely, close the vent indefinitely, fire the cutdowns. This was our preliminary set of, of um, codes. Um, all the codes were echoed by DTMF, and then the float would only react to these specific ones. We would sometimes send other codes, just dummy codes, to, s to make sure that things were getting through. Um, the codes were selected numerically to make sure they were distinguishable after downlink. This uh, pulse width modulation stuff takes a while to settle, and you can't really read that third digit very well, so we needed to make sure the codes were very different from each other numerically, and we had to reserve the one, the one because of the radio we were using. Every time you press push to talk, it would send a one. It's like, okay, I guess one is not going to be part of any code, because one is, is part of every single, every single transmission that we try. Later on, a little hard to read, but I'm just going to point out that we, in, we increased the number of codes a lot. So by the time we got to our last summer, the last time we flew this, we actually had what we called an autopilot that would try to go into a vent at um, a, specific, a specific altitude, and then you could change the altitude when it tried to go into a vent by codes. Um, and so uh, here's what we were doing for our downlink channels. There, were, there was Zigbee downlink from the DTMF, echoing things, telling us how warm it was inside in particular, and then the mission parameters. What is the altitude at which it's gonna automatically go into a vent if it can? Um, and then quickly, uh, the downlink channels from the that were associated with the float, um, you have to make sure that you distinguish between what you told it to do and what it actually did, okay? And uh, the downlink was only about once every 30 seconds, so anything that happens faster than that, you have to <laughs> make sure you don't miss it. So what we did is we had one downlink channel telling us what is the, the vent <coughs> position, another one that was telling us whether or not the vent had pushed a button at the far end which told us that it was fully open, that was independent from what we told it to do, and then how long it had been open cumulatively, and how many times the cutdowns had been called and had they been successful. So this is the sort of thing that we were sending down through the downlink. This is a fail-safe timer, I already mentioned that, I need to finish up here, so I just wanna quickly tell you the results. Not the greatest, actually. Um, it turns out that we inadvertently vented a couple of balloons because we couldn't get that neck to stay together properly, we think we've got that one solved. Um, the DTMF seems to be working and being echoed properly, that's good. But the DTMF, unfortunately, has been finicky, and if that goes down, the whole system fails, unfortunately. So our plan is to make the float a little bit more autonomous in the future. We, we missed testing uh, cutdowns because we kept having premature bursts, that was unfortunate. But this is the most mysterious one, and that is, the one time everything seemed to be working well, and at 60,000 feet we opened the vent, and we left it open for 20 minutes, and it didn't slow the balloon down at all. So in other words, we did what we said we were doing. It didn't work at all in flight, suggesting that maybe we're thinking about this wrong, although maybe we have a chance based on what I just heard from Montana. Okay, so frankly, um, that's why the title, How Not to Vent a Balloon. There's something fairly fundamentally wrong with what we're doing here, and we're trying to understand that. And we're looking for feedback. So uh, here are some assumptions which you might say are questionable. If you have a certain amount of excess lift on the ground, you still have that same amount in the air. Maybe that's actually not true, although I think it's true, but maybe it's not true. But if I'm trying to vent two pounds on the ground, well, maybe I should be venting 20 pounds in the air. I don't think so, but 
Maybe that's an assumption that needs to be reconsidered. If you have excess lift balloons, maybe they do or don't have the right excess lift at altitude. Um, is the efficiency of venting the same on the ground as in the air? I'm pretty sure this is not true at all. Maybe like really not true. That's, that's the one that worries me the most. Um, and then here's one, and that is, if you manage to achieve neutral buoyancy, does your balloon actually stop? You might say, well, there's so little air up there that the balloon, because of inertia, would just keep going up. Again, I don't think that's true, but that maybe is something that should be reconsidered, although what Montana just reported on suggests that you can bring a balloon to rest if you try. So um, here's some potential future directions. We're building another DTMF that can have uplink and downlink. Um, and we're going to put more of, our uh, more of our smarts on the float payload, so if it loses communications, it can do more, even if it doesn't have <coughs> linkage to the ground. And then um, we tried to do essentially what they did, and that is have a flight that uh, we vented and vented and vented at different points in the flight and see how effective it was. We haven't actually done that experiment. It sounds like other people have thought about doing that experiment, and I'd like to return to that. Better still, we'll be able to measure the flow rate experimentally directly. I don't know how to do that. If someone could tell me how to do that, I'd appreciate it. So if ILC venting ends up being just intolerably slow, maybe we'll just have to restart this project in a different direction. So I have uh, this, this stuff with me. I, I welcome feedback on it. Um, and I guess that's as much as I have to say. And I think I may have even almost run over time. But I think there may be time for at least a few questions. Yes? And that's, that's sent, I mean, you get to choose the way in which it's sent? Uh, it's, it's sent, we usually use an RFP 900 to send it up and down. Okay, so that's what, 900 megahertz radio of some sort. Um, I have not looked into that. I don't think my students have looked into that. We just chose DTMF because it's a very old product and it's, it's well understood, but I'm not saying it's necessarily the best thing. So yes, indeed. I mean, we do have radio links, and so maybe we can improve some things. I think our problems mostly lie elsewhere, but sure, we, we could up update our radio linkage to some degree. Sure. Um, probably made because we've heard about it before and not because we, it was well thought out. I'm not actually much of a radio guru myself. Matthew? What, what, what radios are you guys using? I'm kind of curious on the, the, the one being transmitted. What kind of radios are you guys using for that? Well, you mean just the, for the ham radios? Yeah. So we're flying often a, a Yesu VX3, sometimes a Baofeng UV3 on board, okay. um, and then maybe a VX8, Yesu VX8 perhaps from the ground. Not, not a big car radio, but a pretty serious, pretty serious handheld radio. And considering that we managed to get our echoes back, we don't think that's our main problem, although it's true that maybe we're kind of pushing the limits a little bit on the radios, yeah. What, what band were you guys using for that? Seth would know. I don't remember what he chose. Okay. He, did, he did think about it. I don't remember, I don't remember what frequencies it was at. It was, it was, I think it was in the 70 centimeter band. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, thank you. Question up here? Yes? you also use uh, 900 megahertz for downlink of data? So the Stratostar system is a 900 megahertz system. It's proprietary as in we can't fiddle with it. We're not okay. supposed to anyway. So, but it, it's capable of doing this. It does it pretty well. Um, and so we just used it because we had it sitting around. But I would like to kind of attack that problem kind of more from the ground level also. And I think we will do so. And for the moment, we might stick with DTMF. Do you know uh, what data rate you, you get like at distance when you're you're up there? I don't know, and actually I don't care. And the reason is we're just trying to send, you know, three characters at a time, and so it can take a long time if we need to. I mean, in the case of DTMF, you know, you key the things in once every half a second or something like that, and we're mostly doing it by hand as opposed to doing it automatically through a computer, although we could do that. Sure. Um, but the data rate, since we're not trying to really send data, uh, we're, we're just trying to stand, send housekeeping status information and very simple stuff, uh, the data rate doesn't bother us if it's slow, and it is, it is slow. Um, it's not so slow with the Stratostar system, except that that only dumps the data pretty fast, but it only dumps it about once per 30 seconds, and so you have to wait for the data, but when it comes, it comes fast. Sure. Yep. Obviously, I have my I haven't thought about this a whole lot, but it seems like if you compare what you have versus Montana in terms of the, um, the initial lift or the amount of buoyancy you have and then the weight of your payload, how do those compare with? Yeah, I can see that we could get in a situation where you had to vent a lot. 
Well, he already told the story that they, uh, under certain circumstances, were venting, were slowing their balloon down, but failed to slow it down enough, and it burst. We actually failed to slow down at all, which worries me. But, but so it, it does seem that, I mean, it seems that based on their experiences, it's possible. That's good news, OK? Um, I think that the amount of opening we have is similar to what they have, maybe a little bit smaller. Um, and so maybe we'd have to vent a little bit longer. But if they were doing five or 10 minutes, you know, 20 minutes should have done it and, and didn't seem to do it when we, do, when we had our most recent flight, which was the most successful, but it failed. Large amount of buoyancy compared to, you know, your buoyancy to to payload yep. weight seems to be I mean, that ratio seems to be important in terms of. Well, it's true. So essentially, what I don't want to do, I guess, is I don't want to just crawl up there because it's going to go forever. You know. Um, what you could imagine is using like an excess lift balloon that gets you close to neutral buoyancy, and then using this only to tweak it a little bit, and then you wouldn't have to vent a lot. You could vent just a little bit. But I think the ability to vent three or four or five pounds of lift for a 12-pound payload, that is what we would really like to do. We don't want to be limited to venting only a half a pound. That's not enough, because that's not going to be the kind of excess lifts we're dealing with. Um, but no, you might be able to reconfigure the situation so you ultimately only have about that much to vent because you dump the rest of your lift a different way altogether. But can you do some kind of easy calculations just with different scenarios to see how difficult it is going to be to well, that's what I'm saying. I sort of assume that the amount you need to vent on the ground is the same as the amount you need to vent, but I think that's actually an assumption, and I think I should go and rethink or get somebody for me to rethink that kind of from scratch. If you have to vent three pounds worth of excess lift on the ground, is it really still three pounds of excess lift at altitude or not? I think, I think what happens is it is three pounds of excess lift at altitude, but frankly, the rate with which it vents is, is, is somewhat or maybe even greatly reduced. Okay. It's, it's, yeah, it is going to be different. I mean, I think it's quite but it is going to be different. We should, we should talk more. I, I don't claim that I've thought through that, and I do need to, and I, or I do need to get somebody to, to help me think through that. So, um, but yes, indeed. Uh, basically, they were talking about having measurements of differential pressure and calculating exactly, and we haven't gone as far as that, and we need to do more stuff on that because, frankly, we're kind of up, up against a bit of a wall, but I think we'll get over it. Yep. James, what size balloon were you using and what was your payload weight? Mostly these were 1,500 gram came on balloons and mostly our payload weight was close to 12 pounds. So we were often trying to vent maybe three pounds of lift, excess lift at, as measured on the ground approximately. Yes? Talking about the venting mechanism itself, what kind of trade study did you guys perform or design metrics did you guys come up with for the mass flow rate or the inlet design itself? Um, I don't know the answer. I think my students would know the answer, but the, the ones that would know the answer aren't here. Um, they tried a bunch of different things, and we were always trying to keep the weight down. But frankly, this thing ended up to be pretty heavy, and that never satisfied me uh, a lot. But I, I can't tell you the answer to exactly what all they considered, um, other than based on ground testing, we were fairly confident this would work, and, and we're not so confident anymore. Yep. Yeah, so for instance, we would inflate balloons, and we'd put this thing on them, and then we would open it up and close it up by radio, and we would monitor the excess lift until we were figuring out how long it would take for us to reduce this original maybe three pounds worth of excess lift down to two pounds or one pound or zero, in fact. And it only took a few minutes. And so we, we figured that we would have time to do this during a flight. Don't like vacuum tube testing, like to see how pressure would affect your mass We're not able to do that. Essentially, it would be nice to have a situation where you could get a large size object of this sort, or maybe even a small version of this, into a low pressure environment with the appropriate difference of pressure. We don't have the facilities to do that. So we're stuck for the moment anyway. I like their idea, though, of doing a flight where the thing that you were venting was not the main balloon. <laughs> it was just a small balloon nearby. Looks like we're supposed to quit soon. Maybe one more? Yep. So uh, essentially, your flow orifice is a linear actuator that's uh, uncapping the flow rate. Yep. Uh, did you do any cold testing on whether or not cold contraction would uh, increase the amount of force it would take to uncap your flow tube? And maybe the reason that you failed to flow during your test is all your electronics and communications performed adequately, but uh, your linear actuator was unable to provide enough force to actually uncap 
that to and physically vent any helium? It's a reasonable uh, suggestion. I don't think that's what happened, and the reason is underneath this cap, we actually had a push button. So the idea is when it's open, it actually pushes a button and tells us that it's open. And it, said it, it told us it was open. Okay. In other words, we're quite confident it was open. But frankly, if it wasn't open, that would sort of explain what happened to us. But we really think it was open. We'll have to, we'll have to do more flights, clearly. OK, thanks again.